Our Father, let thy blessing rest upon us this day, our last full day together in this great and lovely camp. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to tell of the journey we made around the world. And it really was on the wings of prayer. We were in for constant surprises. Five different times when the planes uh, were not able to carry us for some reason or other for a certain day, postponed or something, it worked out infinitely better. We found that every disappointment turned into God's appointments. But I learned before I'd gone very far why communism exists. It's because the Christians have not been Christians. Wherever the Jesus way was used, uh, communism has been kept out. Whenever we use the force method uh, and the conquering method, and the devil method, communism came walking right in. That is so convincing that I, I, uh, if we could just accept that, preach that one message, it would be worthwhile. In England, <coughs> I discovered when I was uh, cycling through England, Back in 1907, 50 years ago, every fifth man, according to Churchill, every third man was supported by India. They might starve in India, but they lived in abundance in Great Britain on the wealth they took out of India. When we defeated Cornwallis and, uh, at Yorktown, Great Britain sent him to India and he fixed a pattern on India that held them in enslavement for the 150 years. A very unique method that, that saved in England a great deal of money by uh, working out a very splendid and fair tax system. The English are very fair and just in, in uh, handling the details. Uh, but uh, he appointed a, arranged a system of tax collectors that uh, required no pay from Great Britain. They, their own uh, support was uh, gained by the extra tax that they would put on those that they felt they could put it on. The regular publican system of the Rome had put upon, upon uh, Israel. These publicans then, native publicans, became so loyal to Great Britain, and then by holding the mirages, terrific tyrants in control of different states, who also worked in harmony with Great Britain, they kept India a subject nation for uh, hundreds of years. <coughs> the... Uh, <coughs> They did not permit them even to have a fa uh, factories to manufacture goods in, in, in India. The raw material had to be sent to Great Britain so that Great Britain would uh, skim off the profits. They were finally, India was finally liberated because in, uh, Gandhi uh, worked out a wonderful scheme. He announced the world that he was going down to the ocean and manufacture salt with his hands. That was against the law to manufacture anything. So he marched from one village to the next. The villagers would turn out 100,000 perhaps and march with him to the next village. And then the, uh, an escort of 100,000 perhaps or so from that village would march with him down to the next village. Our newspapers were filled for half a month with this march of Gandhi upon toward the sea. And when he went out and manufactured a handful of salt, He's put in the penitentiary by Great Britain, and then the world could just see. The folly of so-called Christian nations 
exploiting, subjugating, enslaving uh, the dark races. All the dark races, with the exception of Thailand and Japan, have been conquered, subjugated, exploited by the so-called Christian nations. When we arrived in Great Britain, Great Britain now had gone through a terrific war and had exhausted all their resources. They had lost India and all that support, and yet I didn't see a single hungry child or a beggar in London. In 1907, little underfed children. Now, under the socialistic regime they have there, every child gets his share of milk. Everyone gets free uh, uh, med uh, doctor's and dentist care. When we were in Italy, we met a dentist, and he said uh, nine out of every ten Italians have bad teeth. Some of them have lost their teeth. I said, why don't you have your teeth fixed? Why, we can't afford it. In Great Britain, we can say all we want to against certain things. But if we want another third war uh, to, to uh, support our way of life, our free enterprise system, it'll be the end of free enterprise because we'll have nothing but rubble in this country, and that's what they have in India and Great Britain. Rubble is not good soil for free enterprise, and the folks are happier and healthier in Great Britain now with all this shortage than they were in the period of wealth where it all was siphoned off into certain hands. Toynbee said, the greatest historian of modern times, the power of communism lies in one thing. They have stolen... They have taken that branch of the Christian uh, economic teachings, which the Christian church has neglected. When, uh, when Jesus went in to, um, uh, back to his hometown, he gave a pre-inaugural address before his inaugural address at uh, the Sermon on the Mount. In that pre-inaugural address, he opened the book Isaiah and he read, I come to bring good tidings to the poor and release to the captives. That's exactly what the Russians, the communists say. They marched into China. They say we're bringing a good tidings to the poor. We're going to cut off the heads of the rich and divide the land with the poor. We're bringing a liberation to the captives. We're going to set you free from this domination of other lands. Every section of China has been preempted by certain Christian lands, Shanghai by Great Britain and so on, and, they, uh, and uh, Hong Kong and all that. And Indochina was under the control of uh, France, uh, Indonesia of Holland. In Holland, whenever a, uh, a Dutchman uh, dealt with an Indonesian, the Indonesian must bow. The Dutchmen didn't have to. One thing the Dutch didn't permit them to do is to have any education. They felt they could control them better. The result is Indonesia is 5% literate. Over here, the Philippines, just across the bay, 95% are illiterate, and Indonesia is bitter in their hatred of the white races because they, now that they're free, they don't, don't know how to read and write. Uh, Turn loose uh, uh, Frank Laubach with a team of, uh, of literacy experts there. He could win them back to Christianity, to uh, win them to Christianity and to free enterprise and all that. I'm just throwing out a few hints like this. For, for 50 miles and more, I rode from um, Amsterdam to, uh, uh, to The Hague in a car driven by the uh, head director of all the printing, of uh, official printing of, uh, uh, of Holland. And I, we passed palace after palace, palace after palace, of millionaire homes in America hardly compared with them. I finally said, well, where did Jap Holland get all its wealth? Oh, our young men would go to the East Indies 
and there they only had to pay five or ten cents a day for the laborers, and they br bring back from the tobacco and all these other great industries o over there, they bring back millions and millions. I was in the, at The Hague, I was uh, entertained in the home of the director, the head of the, the combined t tobacco interests of uh, Indonesia, uh, capitalized at $50 million, a wonderful man. When uh, the uh, Indonesians got their liberty by fighting the British, they put uh, him in a he was in a prison camp for five years, his son in another camp, his wife in another camp, and all their wealth was taken from them. They, he was working at a job about $10 a week, but he was a fine man, and he's written a book on the mistakes of the white races in, uh, in exploiting the dark races. In a loving way, instead of uh, condemning these and hating them, he simply was taking their side. And so, uh, uh, colonialism is doomed. France doesn't seem to know it. They're hanging on to Indochina. When we were <coughs> passing by Indochina, we were told, when the uh, communists had come in, they would say they would divide, give the land to the landless. The landowners there charge 70% of the product uh, of, the, of the workers. They take that as their rent, 70%. In the spring, the, the, the workers on the land don't have enough money to buy seeds. So the money lenders lend them the money at 40% interest just for the three months between uh, seeding and harvest. Uh, so when the, uh, the, the communists come in, they say, we're bringing uh, good tidings to the poor. We're going to give you the land. Then when the French armies would come in and drive out the communists, right behind them would be the money lenders and the landowners. Where's our back rent? Where's the interest on that investment? Until finally the general said to uh, Chester Bowles, our ambassador to India, uh, what, under conditions like this, we, we don't have a chance. A year later, he told Chester Bowles, we've changed our method. Uh, now when we recapture the land, we tell, we tell those who've been given the land, you can keep it. So it's become the slogan all over into China. The thing to do is let the communists come in and give us the land. And then when the, and then, uh, 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 then let the French come in and drive them out. And that way we have the land and we don't have to be communists. We found in um, uh, Formosa uh, no beggars. We found they were producing five times as much as they had before for this reason. Under Chiang Kai-shek, they have uh, given the land to the landless, made a rule that no one can own more than, I believe, 20 acres. And they, but they pay the landowners. Good, safe, and free enterprise method. They, the government buys up the land and distributes it. And then when they're working on their own land, they produce five times as much when they're working as mere serfs. The result is there are no beggars and, and, and from Mosa, and all was good, well. We found over in, uh, in uh, Japan, that uh, General MacArthur had uh, had them buy up the land and uh, from the landowners to pay pay them their pay and then distribute among the landless. The result is they are safe from communism also. But I'm going to tell you something. It wasn't Chiang Kai-shek that did this. He was made a tre tremendous mistakes over in China, which if he had stepped into the Jesus method or if we had ended the corruption there. We would, uh, communism never would have come in. Uh, and MacArthur didn't work out the plan. There's a man named Lad Ladinsky, a man who'd been born in, in Russia. And then the reactionaries in the United States recall Ladinsky because he'd been born in Russia and he was 
getting a, working out a system by which the landless was getting the land in a fair way, but the cry went up among our, our reactionaries over here. Uh, that's what we call creeping socialism. Let's withdraw him as a red risk. And the leaders of Japan came out when we were there saying, isn't it too bad that the one man that has saved Japan from communism is being withdrawn because they're afraid that he's a red risk. If you try to use the Jesus methods, you find that it's the Jesus followers holding the big money bags often are the ones that condemn you and call you a red risk. The, the, way, the way to have saved us from communism has been, a, uh, been misrepresented. In, in, the, in China, a graduate of Jap uh, a Chinese who had graduated from, uh, from uh, Yale, a YM man went over and he worked out a system by which they would send four representatives to the village, to a certain districts. One was an expert in food and health, one in agriculture, one in literacy, and one in social democracy. He had reached several hundreds of villages and prosperity was coming in and absolute security against communism. Then the war came on. When the war uh, ended, uh, this Yen asked uh, Chiang Kai-shek to help him uh, uh, send out these helpers and continue this program. And he said exactly made the mistake that Churchill and Roosevelt made. When we asked them to agree on the war aims, they said we're too busy winning this war. We'll do it afterwards. He said our first business is defeat the communists. After that, we'll, I'll, uh, I'll give attention to what you say. Yen said you're never going to defeat the communists on the battlefields. You've got to defeat the communists in the rice, uh, in the rice fields, and in the villages, had he furnished that team and let that go out, communism would not have come in. The evils by which, and the corruption that came in was so terrific in China that even uh, that several million of the conscripts of Xiang's army died of starvation because the officers were selling. The, their, their food on the black market. Uh, we sent a commission over there that came back to Truman and, uh, and, and uh, Dean Acheson and said, don't send any more guns until they reform. Because they're, and uh, then uh, Senator Noland, and I'm sorry to say our own Walter Judd that I admire and love so much, but he so loves Chiang Kai-shek. He said, if he don't send them the guns right away, uh, they're going to be defeated. So he sent the guns, and what did they do? Why, the Russian soldiers were starving there. They simply sold them to the communists and furnished the communists with all the arms they needed. Chiang Kai-shek himself admitted, he said this, if we'd had several hundred thousand Christians, for it's noticeable, the Christians do not... Uh, are free from corruption everywhere. If he'd had several hundred Christians, uh, the story would have been different. But he could have, what the word was, don't send them this until they reform. You've got to reform on the inside first and wherever that was done, communism was kept out. Well, when we were in, in England, 200 and 30 folks came to the camp farthest out, a sifted group from all over Great Britain, 33 wonderful ministers. They've just carried that torch and opened up the door so that this year they're having two camps farthest out. And they were just thrilled. They participated in everything. And I was amazed that these uh, 33 uh, ministers and clergymen, many of them uh, Anglicans with their vests on backwards, they even took off their collars, if necessary, went into the rhythms. So they, call, said, uh, they shouted out to one of them, I, we never had so much fun in all our lives since we were boys. And they're just enthusiastic about it, participated in everything. We went to Holland, and we had two camps farthest out there. 
and then Mr. Vanderveen, the man who had been head of that great tobacco trust uh, in, in Indonesia, my host, said, you've been invited uh, the, to uh, visit, uh, to, to go to the palace tomorrow, uh, the Princess uh, Wilhelmina. Uh, wants to see you three because she's had a cold and hasn't been able to go to the meetings. And I want to say we had a wonderful visit with her. I praised her for her humility. And she said, oh, queens have to learn how to be humble. The first lesson a good queen must learn is how to be humble. Yes, the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, I found they have one thing as uh, something of an advantage over there in, in this prince, these queens, we find that over here we all argue against this, uh, this president and that president, half are for him and half against him and all this, divided in parties. Over there they have their division between the Tories and the Labour Party, but they all unite in loyalty to the Crown. And uh, the, the love and the devotion to the Queen is something that unites them just like that. And we found that in the same way in the Netherlands. And when they had a great calamity, uh, the queen went, and Princess Wilhelmina, who's been, who'd been queen for 50 years, they went out to where the suffering was and blessed the folks and helped them and supervised and saw what the needs were. And they're tightening their belts. They also have had uh, their high standard of living was built on the suffering and the privation of the dark races they are tightening their belts, just like they are in Great Britain, and they are stronger, they're more, they're, they win your goodwill better than they did back in the days when they were living on the fruits of the, of the, and the sweat of the brow of the other underlings. So we saw that the way to save this world is to simply apply, up, and this world, communism is merely to apply the teachings of Jesus. So they'd come in there and they'd take the name Jesus off of this uh, social philosophy and they put the name Marx on it and said, we're the ones that's going to bring good tidings to the poor and set free the captives. The United States made the mistake of our lives when we poured billions into to France to keep Indonesia enslaved. I admit, it's made it known all over the, there that we who were the first to, with our declaration of independence, we're the fighting against independence of any nation but our own. However, we were the ones that gave the perfect model of how to handle colonialism. We made promises to the Philippines and we kept it. At the time to, the, to give them their liberation, we did. And it's marvelous at the, the different capitals of the world to see when the 4th of July comes, we see that the Filipinos and the Americans celebrate their Independence Day the same day. We sent thousands of, of teachers over to the Philippines and lifted the standard of living and their, lifted their, uh, their literacy rate and everything up. Many of those teachers died of, of, of Asiatic diseases. No other nation ever sent a single teacher. Great Britain was one of the sinners also. But now that she has liberated India, India is more loyal to Great Britain, a better friend of Great Britain than when she was a slave of Great Britain. Well, we don't know some of those things. And when this Leginsky was sent back here, what did Eisenhower and uh, John Foster Dulles do? But to absolve him and send him at once to Indonesia. Had he been sent to Indonesia in 1951, when we started to pour billions in there to kill the Indonesians, had we sent Leginsky there and, and uh, bought up the land from landowners and distributed it, Communism wouldn't even got in the threshold, and I did make that so plain in this book. And contrast the method of a nation held in bondage by a so-called Christian nation, France, with Burma under the Buddhist control, who took over the Jesus methods, although they were so-called Buddhists, and put it into application, where the communists were far more powerful in, in Burma than they were in Indonesia. They have just swept communism out. 
There's a contest going on between India and China. One is a nation devoted to democracy, one to, uh, to communism. We found in our camps farthest out in, uh, in uh, India, we found uh, disciples of Gandhi. And with the one that we, the most remarkable disciple, we didn't have him personally, but, but uh, his disciples were with us. I refer to Vinoba, a man in perfect contrast to Gandhi. <coughs> Gandhi was no scholar. Uh, Vinoba is a marvelous scholar, no seven uh, d different languages. But like Gandhi, he has read and he, uh, the Bible only much more thoroughly even than Gandhi. He knows the New Testament almost by heart. He has written interpretations of it. He just takes Jesus, as Gandhi did, as his model. He refuses to become a Christian just like Gandhi because he can't find a so-called Christian nation that dares to use the Sermon on the Mount in statesmanship. And so India, so-called British nation, uh, Christian nation that wouldn't let them even hold their heads up and manufacture anything. Uh, here in contrast is Vinoba. He goes from village to village uh, urging the rich, the landowners, to give out of love, not to have their heads cut off, but just to lovingly give the land as Jesus would give them. He's almost a little replica of Frank Laubach, who goes into a nation and will teach them, uh, teach them how to read. And they're so thrilled, but they say, now, what are you going to get out of this? Every white man that's ever brought us anything has enslaved us. Are you going to get us in debt or something? No. Uh, a man 2,000 years ago taught me how to love people. We're doing it just for love. Well, we want to learn more about him. Well, and, uh, the first book you're going to read uh, when you learn is going to be the story of Jesus. He's hardly there a week before they all want to become Christians. Now that is something almost unheard of, but that's the way Vinoba does. He goes in, he went there and said, and uh, he went to a, a village that he heard they were getting ready to turn communists. They were going to take the land away from the, the rich. And he said to these uh, these starving folks, just wait. I won't let me get the village, all the villagers together tomorrow. He got up and he presented a proposition. He said, most of you have five sons, we'll say. Well, call me the six. You're going to give your land, divide it up among those five. I'm going to ask you to divide it among six and give me. I'm, I'm your sixth son. I'm, your, I'm coming here as your son. I'm asking you for a sixth of your land. He began with the poor landowners, and they induced them to do it. Then he went to the rich landowners, and, he, and they were shamed into giving. Now he goes from village to village, on foot. There are millions of, uh, hundreds of thousands of villages. He can't reach them all. When, uh, uh, when he, uh, they hear that he's approaching, they all pray in that village. Uh, those who don't have land pray that he will come. Those who do have land pray that he won't come. <laughs> he has gotten millions of acres given in love. Over there in uh, China, there's millions of acres been distributed to the poor by cutting off the heads of the landowners. There's a contest between Christianity and communism right there. Well, it's thrilling. It is thrilling to find that we, the United States, hold, stand so firmly in, in the Philippines. They're not going to be Christians. Uh, they're not going to be Christians, I and mean, they're not going to be communists, because they are. They have contacted a so a really Christian uh, capitalistic nation, and they'll stand by us. Now, this Yen, whom uh, Chiang Kai-shek turned down. The opportunity to have saved China, he turned down. And now our State Department has sent Yen down to the Philippines. And he's sending those four uh, folks to the villages and he's building up the Philippines. All you need to do is to find the man like that and to put him in the right place. And that's why, that is why uh, Koinonia is like a Noah sees in the desert. 
is training that type of men. Uh, we didn't train, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we didn't have the good fortune there to train Vinoba, who's changed saving India. But we have trained um, uh, J. Uh, uh, Bayer, who has uh, lifted up uh, Pakistan and won the goodwill absolutely and forever for the United States. A letter from his wife says that the Christians over there, uh, just to go out under the name of Christians, even the missionaries are sort of, uh, we found that everywhere. They're just run of the mill, just carrying on and having regular church services here and there. But uh, she found out they find the Muslims get down on their knees five times a day and pray, and they don't have much respect for the, for the Christians. But they're enthusiastic about the Bayards. There's a closer bond between the real spiritual Muslims and the real spiritual Christians than there are between the Christians and the lukewarm Christians. Too much of us, our religion, we go to our churches and we go to a middle-class rotary club. Uh, 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 during the prohibition, uh, 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 an old toper was given a glass of near beer and asked his opinion of it. He said, whoever called this near beer was a poor judge of distance. <laughs> Frank Laubach will bear this out as we travel around the world. We are more hurt by the dead... Uh, weak, little wishy-washy, uh, anemic quality of Christianity that are rather shocked if you really believe in prayer than we are with the pagans who are willing to come over halfway with us. Well, at any rate, <clears throat> what we need is to re-Christianize Christianity. I think perhaps I told you when we were in, uh, in uh, uh, Ceylon, a young woman who came to the camp farthest out, all through the camp, and then followed us in Colombo to our, hear all of our speeches. When we got on the plane to, to fly to Singapore, she slipped an envelope into my pocket. She's now head of a splendid business of, uh, that she's developed over there of, uh, of importation and so on, and exportation. I opened this and she said, years ago, I was dissatisfied with a rather anemic kind of religion I found in the churches. So I came over to India to study under the great masters, to study the yogi and everything else they had. I wanted to go way out into those mysteries. I've been here now for years and I've learned all of that. It wasn't until we came, I came to the camp farthest out that I found the real religious vitality that I've been seeking all my life. That which I'd been seeking and traveling all over came clear over abroad to find that was right there at my palace doors, as you might say, uh, Sir Lawnfall and some seeking for the Holy Grail, right here at the palace door, right there in my homeland if I'd only known where to find it. I had lost my Jesus. You gave him back to me. I'll never cease thanking the Lord that you came here. And the missionaries, almost without a fail, almost unanimously would say, we need this more than the native Indians. We, uh, our faith isn't as great as these Buddhists and Hindus in many cases. We just help distribute the food for millions or things like that, but any, wise, any uh, distributing agent could do that. We need you. Send your team over here next time in May or when, uh, when we have our holidays and we're up in the mountains. Come up there in the mountain and have a, uh, we'll get 300 missionaries together and you, you re-Christianize us and then we'll go out and we'll re-Christianize India. There's a number of reasons why the camps farthest out should spread fast because now these dark races say we're through with all this imperialism. You may not be aware of it, they would say, but you've been imperialistic in your, in your religion. 
you say the only way to get to heaven is by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and throwing out all the old, all this old uh, wonderful riches of the uh, treasures of, uh, of uh, the, the past. If you would come in and uh, you, let us keep all that wonderful literature of Buddhism as our Old Testament and then bring in your Jesus. But if you'd bring it in as the Camp Father Stout bringing it in, teaching them how to follow and live these teachings of Jesus all right, but we will not let Billy Graham, our single evangelist, come in here. We'll get up here and say, you're all going to, if you die tonight, you'll all go to hell. You've got to come up here and kneel down and accept this own one way. So we have a brand of teaching that they received enthusiastically because we, they're eager to receive any. They love to talk religion in India. They'll talk until midnight, all day long. They accept, they, they're, gen, they're very uh, 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 hospitable. They bring in all religions. They'll even, here's the, we found a church, the monkey god. Well, they let them even have that. Uh, they, uh, they, they grade it, though. They, those that have that superstitious, just believe in idols, they put that at the lower level. Up here, the, those that uh, have this sort of religion, they put them higher. Those that have, they believe in the absolute, the absolute, unseen, infinite, they put them at the very top. And they love the Christians who really come and teach them how to live their religion because that's what they're trying to do. They, they feel that all of them are doors. And they won't say that any door is wrong, but you're wrong if you don't go far enough. I was in a gathering and I found two men that were such marvelous souls. Finally asked them what their religion was. One was a Jew, a faithful Jew, and the other was a faithful uh, Hindu. But, oh, they were so thrilled. They went to all our meetings. The Parsis, they get, their religion is Zoroaster. Zoroaster, and, Zoriaster, and, they, get, and the, they are the, the most successful. They're, they're the most dependable and absolutely uh, uh, sound, honest workers. They have a, Zoriaster's writings sound like the Proverbs and the Psalms. A very beautiful Parsi woman, they're called the Parsis, uh, came with her mother, and uh, she said, I love my Zoriaster just as you love your Jesus. But nearly after every talk, she came up and said, I, I copied down your prayer. Can I take that back? I said, you can take back anything we've got. But she said, I'm going to take my people, uh, Jesus, to you, my people and get them to love your Jesus. Uh, he certainly has something wonderful. And uh, one was a... One was a a Hindu, a Brahmin. He said, I, I belong to Brahmin caste and uh, nothing can equal the Hindu religion. The last day he came and wanted to kneel down, he said, I want to become a, a fisher of men. And so they'll take Jesus in one hand. This is what, the way, this is the way uh, Gandhi liberated India. He took the Sermon in the Mount in one hand and the Bhagavad Gita in the other and he went around Indian, without the firing of a gun, he liberated one-fifth the human race from the greatest empire that ever existed because he said, the greatest teaching in the world is Jesus, who said, turn the other cheek and love your enemies. And wherever that's used, the most marvelous, almost miraculous things are happening with folks that don't, don't like to even take the name. They're ashamed of the name of Christian some places. I was when I found I couldn't get any liquor in India, and as I didn't want any, but if I would go in a hotel and ask for it, they'd say, oh, we don't permit any liquor. But if you're an American Christian, they have some, they permit to give there some to American Christians. And then there's, so there is, I'm going to tell you now two, three other reasons why communism has come in. One is because free enterprise uh, capitalistic system is the most efficient system in the world. Marvelous. It's brought all this wealth and abundance where we just live and roll in it, where they're just starving abroad. And they don't have our good uh, scientific, efficient capitalistic system. But we're so efficient that every, every 10 or 20 years we produce so much, uh, we, we, we can't distribute it. And uh, 12 million men are thrown out of employment. And the sh surest way to prevent a war, I mean a, a revolution, 
and the throwing the people in power out the top is to put them in uniform and start them into a war. We didn't have any war in 1843 and we had a terrible depression. We had a war in 1863 and we didn't have any depression. Any, uh, but in 1873, we didn't have any war and there was a terrific crash. In 1893, we didn't have war and there was a terrific crash. But in those days, uh, whenever the men were out thrown out of employment, they'd just get into covered wagons and go out into our frontier and open up new territories. So it was the most marvelous system. How a marvelous system. It was a fine way to, to build up that uh, the frontiers was to have these depressions come and then the unemployed would go out. But in 1893, the, our frontier was officially closed. From that time on, uh, we began to have labor troubles and war between capital and labor. <coughs> And we would have gone into a depression, they all say, if we hadn't had a war in, in 1914. We didn't have a war in 18, 1929, we had an awful depression. Uh, <clears throat> why did we go in the war in, 19, in, in 1917? Because the Lusitania was sunk. La Follette and St. Paul told us the real reason. He, uh, the, the, he said that the Lusitania was carrying contraband. It was carrying munitions of war, and it was very perfectly legitimate to sink it. The reason uh, that Woodrow Wilson, who was elected on the slogan, he kept us out of war, uh, why we declared war was this. The ambassadors in Belgium sent, our ambassador sent word that we were in for a tremendous crash. There's going to, there's going to be a terrific crash on Wall Street if we didn't get into the war. Our steel trust had sold $400 million worth of steel to France and England, and they found they were betting on the wrong horse, and they weren't going to ever get that money back, and they never would have gotten it back. But the day, almost the day after we declared war, the, out of our state's treasury, out of your taxes and my taxes, we, you and I, paid off that debt to the steel trust, because now it's our war. And so they came out riding on, making billions of dollars. And we went into the war and lost many, many men. Churchill himself said if we had not gone into the war in 1917, if he'd kept out of the war, it would have ended as a negotiated peace. Neither side would have won. Communism would not have been born. A million bo uh, German, French, and English soldiers would have been saved. Their lives have been saved. Uh, the question is, and this is what the communists say, they're warmongers because they will, the only way to keep out of uh, uh, these crises is to go to war. Now that's wrong. And now we have met that test by a marvelous system of uh, income taxes. Now, some of our rich folks don't like that, the, the trippy income taxes. But it's the best way, to, it's the way that's going to save capitalism. And old age pensions, the unemployment insurance, and the federal land banks. I think we've become depression proof. So that stigma that held out by the communists is wrong. They, they, Stalin said, we'll go in, the United States will go into a crash in 1945 as soon as that war is over. And they liberated those a million or two, three or four million men. They're going to a great crash and then they'll all turn socialist and communist, what's never come. But there's two other things where we've been sinners and one of them has been our, our race. Uh, consciousness, and we wonder why, if it's been unconstitutional all these years to segregate them, why the, uh, the Supreme Court only took that action in the last few years. I'll tell you why. Down in Washington, they know how communism is just spreading and going to sweep the whole world. And one of the, the big slogans is, every time, by the way, any Negro is lynched here, it makes a million more communists. And they hold that out, that they can't even, the dark races can't even ride in the train with the white races. And they're all dark races. We're the minority now. And they rise up against it. But with that decision, we have saved uh, millions from becoming communists. But there's another thing that I am very sorry about. This, we are under, under our capitalistic system, uh, we have the marvelous system of free enterprise, and there's only one place, as I can see now, that it's gone to seed. 
I say it's, uh, it's the one crime of the uh, prophet system. It has put us uh, hook, line, and sinker into enslavement to the addiction trust. I want to make that very clear. Every avenue of publicity is controlled by the addiction trust. You sit down before a television and what do you have? Blue ribbon. What do you have? Blue ribbon. What do you have? Blue ribbon. <laughs> you open up and up. <laughs> you open up a magazine and you'll see the gentleman of distinction drink Calvert. You go to a movie and the sweet little uh, sweethearts at the end uh, uh, may come from the farm and everything else, but they always celebrate with a, uh, with a good big bottle of, uh, of uh, what is the word I'm trying to <laughs> Yes. And I asked the senator, uh, which was the most powerful lobby, he said, oh, nothing compares to the liquor lobby. There isn't a single senator would dare vote a single thing against the liquor trust. You know what this drinking of liquor has accomplished? In the first place, 65, 65 million, which is far the big majority of the adults of America, drink. I suppose a third of you sitting here drink. Uh, occasionally, uh, the cocktails, and, it, uh, and it's, I'm saying it's perfectly innocent. It isn't going to hurt, uh, hurt most of you. But of those 65 million, 3 million, 700,000, practically 4 million of them, are hopeless addicts. We could save a million of those if we could abolish all liquor advertisements. We have a bill before the Congress for that effect, and do you think it'll have a chance to pass? They have three million slaves in the slave camps of Russia. Not a one of them suffering as much as a liquor, hopeless uh, uh, alcoholic does here. I'm saying that and I'm repeating it. The worst hell there is is to be an alcoholic. George Hales will tell you that. Mary's sitting out here and half a dozen others have gone through that will tell you that. I have had them come and commit crimes to get put in the penitentiary. When one young man forged my name and, I, uh, and the FBI came out, the, the bank phoned me, the company, the, the uh, dry goods company phoned me that if I'd prose prosecute, they would put him in the penitentiary. Well, if I didn't, uh, he'd go scot-free if he, the money was paid back which I said I would do. But he came out with his mother and his wife and he said, don't you dare uh, hold back from prosecuting me. I want to be, I did that purposely to be put in the penitentiary, the only place I can be safe. If I could be put in a Russian prison camp, I'd be only too glad. Well, I said I'd let him go in if he'd write a story of his life and he, and uh, I used my influence to make it just two years. Otherwise, it might have been 20, and he asked me to do that. He came out, unfortunately, when I was out of town, so he went down in his basement and hung himself. If you read the happy story of my childhood, written by my sister Helen Wentworth, or our, of the, si the six children, there are four, there are four uh, little women and five little peppers, and there are six little clerks. It's a fascinating little story, and... Uh, there were eight cousins because we were right next door with these cousins and Ralph. Oh, just my age, he was the sweetest young man there ever was. But he went into an inner room and put a gun, revolver in his mouth and blew all his brains out. Because there wasn't anyone kind enough to put him in a Russian prison camp. I am here to tell you something. They don't let you drink over there in Russia, the soldiers. They didn't let them drink during the war. Uh, the they, Japanese were not even permitted to smoke cigarettes. Our soldiers are all given six cans of beer a, a week and all the cigarettes they can smoke. Mothers have told me I, rather, I, I wish my son had been killed with a quick death over there in Korea instead of coming back to die a slow death, bringing misery to the whole family. 
There are actually millions that have been made addicts. There they control the government. They, the government have to put in this, uh, give those, uh, that li liquor and all that. There's no one that dares vote against them. I'm here just to register the, our helplessness. It doesn't even get in our magazines and papers. Why? Because, because they're controlled by the advertising interests. Now, having said all that, you can see why some of our boys going over there, putting under an, an, an ever taken prisoner and then indoctrinated for a while, have some of them have become communists. It isn't until they actually become a communist and find that their uh, enslavement is just as bad or worse a whole lot infinitely worse than ours, but on one area, let me make that clear, on one area we have been, the Christian, so-called Christian nations are absolutely the sinners. And we make an appeal to stop advertising. They say, why, we're in the land where it's supposed to have freedom of press. You can't stop us from saying what we want to say, and we're going to tell them how nice it is to get drunk. And so we can't stop them. A hundred years ago, the, uh, the Chinese abolished the opium traffic. And then the British gunboats came in and said, you're hurting the profits of our good old capitalistic system that's built on the profits uh, that uh, our Burma opium raisers. You've got to put it back. They had the opium wars, and finally the capitalist nations had the biggest guns. We forced it back. For 150 years, they have been devastated by the most terrible plague in the universe, infinitely worse than the the invasion of the Japanese, all because of the profit system of the English nation requiring them to become enslaved to the worst, worst habit, infinitely worse than the liquor habit. Well, having said all that, uh, what do we have to say for the, for the good? I want to say that now our Christianity has to have vitality in it. Not only faith in prayer, but a fr fr frankly admitting that we've made some mistakes and we're willing to, to do something against it. We have uh, gotten rid of our, uh, our, uh, our recurring uh, depressions now. Uh, we uh, have gotten rid. Uh, we're getting uh, the, uh, the, the race question under control, and there's where we need a lot of prayer now to complete that. But on this liquor thing, we are the blight, we are just simply the, the shame of the nations. And we, you, down in, uh, in Morocco, they don't, the Muslims, they don't permit it to drink. But the, uh, the son of the king uh, got drunk and killed someone. And the king said, all right, you can uh, punish him behead him or anything you want. They put him in the penitentiary, and then the king found out that because he had hobnobbed a lot of Christian uh, uh, folks over there, and they got him in the habit, and then he's, so then he put up a law that no more drinking folks should be put in control, and he let his son out. The sin goes way back. I could go on and on along this line, but, uh, um, now, uh, when we reached um, uh, the Philippines, uh, when we reached the, uh, Egypt, the only thing I went there for was to see the uh, the Great Pyramid. I didn't know if anybody wanted to hear us speak. And we were met at the at the port by a young minister who took us to a uh, singspiration. All the young people who could talk English there in Cairo. And they had a wonderful song time, and then we addressed them, and they were just thrilled. Uh, this is Dr. Said, the greatest minister of all Egypt, had me address his, his church of 2,000 people, uh, two-thirds of them men, all, most of them wearing fezzes. And he, uh, he came to had us meet with all the leading ministers several times. We spoke in all the churches, the, mini and the churches we spoke in the, um, the, the college. For women, we're all the daughters of the famous leaders, uh, Haley Selassie and so on are there. Why, they were just to open up all of Cairo. He had gallstones and it was not to uh, be safe to be operated. There's no one in uh, Egypt that could operate on him. 
He couldn't afford to pay his way to the United States, and he had Roland and me pray for him. I said we would, uh, I, I'd send him a, this uh, love offerings you give, I mean, um, these um, honorariums you give to us leaders. Uh, as I don't need them for myself, I said, I'll send you $1,000 and pay your way over. He came over to be operated on. I said, on condition you'll spend a, go to a camp farthest out and spend some time in the Koinonia. He came over and he found that the prayers of ours had cured him of the gallstones. He went to the camp farthest out in Virginia for the two camps. He came and spent some time at Koinonia. He is going to prepare the ground with his wonderful influence of his for several camps farthest out in Egypt. He's going to have the, uh, one of the greatest uh, series of mass meetings. I don't believe that Billy Graham will have any bigger audiences that he's arranging for Roland Brown. By giving the, the right money at the right time and reaching the right man, uh, that's why I feel that capitalism should be used. Instead of spending billions for arms or millions for liquor, just a little here and there. You may not know when I'm say, saying that if the 30,000 CFOers but ever get, each give $10 a year for the next three years. That would be the $300,000 that would enable us to give scholarships and send out trainees from the Koinonia all over the world. So we can send teams, not only just to that one little trip we had, it only cost us $10,000 or less. With several $10,000, we could have three teams every year uh, spreading out all over this world. Oh, I want to say that we, we, we made contacts that are going to have no end uh, value. When I went to, up in the, um, I will want to, I've got to be drawing this to a close. I didn't realize how I was spreading. And therefore, you just take this. And you know, everything I've been telling you, you'll find right in here. And we're going to send <laughs> copies to every, uh, every senator and every congressman, every member of the cabinet is going to be reading this. Stassen is reading it right now, and the President Eisenhower is reading it. And, we, and I'd like to have you read it and imagine what effect that might have on them. Because if this should be caught up with all of them, why, we could just almost change the world. I do want to say this in conclusion. We went up in that great pyramid. And I'll tell you why we, I wanted to go up in that inner corridor. When I was a boy of 12, my uncle said very blandly way back in 1894, in 1914, 10 years from now, no, 20 years from now, the whole world's going to be at war. And I laughed at him. He said, yes, it's, t it's foretold in the pyramid. Every inch represents something, and every dip means something. And uh, the French Revolution was prophesied. Jesus was prophesied in it. So I wanted to go up and see that corridor. So we went up, and we came finally to the top. And then we went along, and we had to put our head down to the First World War. And November 11th, we could put our head up, and then we went along, we came to the Depression. Why, we didn't know the Depression was almost as bad as the war, and I guess in many ways it was. Then we came along, and we came into the King's Corridor, which was the, the, the King's Chamber, which was at the very top, and ends up against the wall. But right in the center of the corridor of the King's Chamber was a tomb, great big open sarcophagus. The beginning of that was the beginning of the Second World War, and the end of it was the end of it. Wouldn't that be a marvelous prophecy that there is the grave of world wars? And then over against the wall, we reached that according to the time schedule, it be August, uh, August uh, 16, 1953. The Time magazine, uh, the issue of August 31st, 1953, had this statement. Uh, this signifies... Uh, this was striking the wall, that's the end of uh, aggressive wars and the beginning of the sacrament of nations. In other words, that any nation that, uh, that starts an aggressive war is going to bat their heads against the wall, and I think that it is so ver perfectly verified with the atomic materials we have now that any nation that starts a war is going to be simply blown off the face of the earth. So I stood in that sarcophagus, and Roland Brown got in beside me. The, the picture is where he took it, and he was outside of it. But when he, then he got in beside me, and with it, 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 some Egyptian young ministers, one of them now is in America studying uh, to work under Frank Laubach in the, uh, in the literacy, 
and over here at Marston, the, the Christians, I gave this prayer that um, that uh, here the East uh, and the West meet, the old the East, the oldest nation and the newest nation, and we're uniting here in a prayer for world peace, and we're lifting this old world up, and we had, a, just like we had a broadcast last night, right there in the King's Chamber, in the place of prophecy, where the prophecy is there that the wars are turning in, we just focused it into a prayer in which we felt all your prayers joining us and going right up into the sky. I would like to tell you the last night we had in, uh, in uh, Palestine, we went out to catch the plane, and a terrific wind was so great they said it won't be safe you're going to send you back and spend another night in Palestine I said when I got into my bed I said now here I am it's my last time and I'll ever be in Jesus land I'm going to spend the night with Jesus and in my imagination I just talked to my my uh, guardian angel John of Patmos and I asked if I could have a little time with Jesus there before I left in Jesus land he said when the time comes I'll waken you and it seemed after a while I was, he was shaking me. And I said, he said, uh, uh, he, he said, the time's come. And I said, what time? He said, why, well, I'd find it easier to awaken 2,000 people than to wake you. And I said, and when you're shaking me, you're shaking the inertia of 2 billion people. Well, he said, the Jesus waiting for you. So I put on my sandals and my, my, uh, uh, Robe and I dressed like the, 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 the way back 2,000 years ago. I went up to the Mount of Olives and there was Jesus looking at the at the, the shining dawn. I sat at his feet and asked him if he had any message for our nation, our time. And he said, "You who live in a time like this, where the, their inventions are just oh, breaking through the barriers of time and space." You've got to live in the spirit uh, in the spirit of eternity and infinity. Uh, uh, one uh, cannot uh, you one cannot live unreborn in an age where people talk across continents and fly across oceans, where time and space no longer control, where only eternity exists. A man in that world must be reborn into infinity. He cannot live safely beyond time and space unless he has found the secrets of eternity. In such an age, the man who limits himself kills himself. Many men in your time will die beneath the wheels of the chariots of war by the arrows of hate because your leaders have not been reborn. Unless your people can find the doorways of love and prayer and throw them wide open, as wide as you open the doors of inve to invention and discovery, and through repentance and surrender, die unto the little self and be reborn to the great self, the doors of death will yawn wide for entire nations. Unless you be born again in love, you shall die and find rebirth in suffering. And how can the evil days be shortened, I cried. Only through turning to the Father in love and devotion, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to the neighbor at your gates with forgiveness, tolerance, and goodwill. 